What a uh, touching and moving song that was, and to have the, the video uh, playing the cemeteries, uh, the tombstones. Uh, how many of you have been to a national cemetery where, where there's just thousands and thousands in rows and rows and rows of crosses or tombstones? And it's sobering. I think it's an important thing to do. Uh, we've been to Arlington National Cemetery and uh, a very beautiful but sobering place. As far as the eye can see, the, the graves go on and on. And then a very similar experience that all, most or all of our missions trips go to when they go to the Philippines is the, the American cemetery there in Manila. Manila is a chaotic place. I mean, just uh, hustle and bustle and horns and cars and people and everything. And then all of a sudden you go into this beautifully ma uh, manicured landscape grounds and it's, the, it's very similar, uh, but a, a beautiful monument to those that died in the Pacific Theater of World War II. And again, thousands of our service people buried there. Um, and, and when you look at all the, the history of the wars that have been fought to protect what we have, it's staggering. It really is. So what we're going to do today is talk about this and remember to remember. I think remembering can be good and bad. You know, many people are haunted by their past. And I don't think we need to remember those things. Those things that God has forgiven us. Those things that happened and they were confessed. The, the person that we sinned against we made right, and those things are gone, literally, as far as the east is from the west, buried in the deepest sea, right? Uh, our sins are forgiven when we've received the gift of eternal life. Forgiveness is thorough, and it's complete. We still might have to live with the consequences of some of those things, and those, the, the, the memories, though, will be thrust back into the front of your mind by the devil. He's going to do that. He's going to try to discourage you. He's going to try to say, hey, you can't do this. You can't serve the Lord. You can't live a life uh, that is godly and a life that will please God. And he'll keep bringing those things up. The little clip we played of Real Life Talks, uh, we played the segment about the, the, the harshness and the sadness that divorce can bring. And, but we also said in that same real life talks that God forgives and God restores. And there is hope even in the midst of such a, a hardship in life. So not bringing those things to mind all the time, but what should we remember? Well, there are things in the scripture that the Bible tells us that we better not forget. We're reminded as we are coming up on a Memorial Day, which will be tomorrow, of the sacrifice that many people have made for us, for our freedoms, that we can literally just come in here and sit down with no fear, with no worry, with not, not even the, the, the slightest bit of, of hesitancy to come in that we might be arrested or the, the police might come and throw us out. Nothing like that. But many countries, you cannot do this. You cannot have a church building. You cannot uh, have a church sign. You cannot meet publicly I mean, we have billboards promoting our church. Uh, you cannot do anything like that in many, many, many places in the world. And so I think we have to remember that we have great freedoms in this country. One of the Navy SEALs, the, the, probably the most famous one, the one that shot bin Laden, said this, Memorial Day is not a celebration. Memorial Day is a time for reflection, pause, remembrance, and thanksgiving. For patriots who gave up their own lives to protect the lives and freedom of us all, including the freedom of generations long gone and generations yet unborn. We owe the fallen a debt so enormous that it can never be repaid. And we're sitting here today not celebrating Memorial Day, but we're sitting here today observing Memorial Day, and we cannot repay the debt. But it is right and it is honorable for us to stop and think about what they did for us and the blood that was shed. Literally over a million people died in combat. Americans died in combat to protect this freedom. Memorial Day 
unofficially marks the beginning of summer. And I know many of you are looking forward to a day off tomorrow and a barbecue and, and similar things and festivities. But Memorial Day has a real deep and meaningful history. It was once known as Decoration Day. And in 1868, General John Logan, the president of the Grand Army of the Republic, he declared this. He said, the 30th of May is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion, of course, the Civil War, and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet, churchyard in the land. Almost a half a million people died in that conflict, the one that would seem like it shouldn't have happened. But again, that was one that was fought to protect the Union, which protects our liberty and our freedom. It was in 1971 that Memorial Day was set as the last Monday of May. And on this solemn day, the flag of the United States is raised to the top of the pole and then solemnly brought down to half-mast. It stays there until noon, where it is raised again, and it stays there for the rest of the day. Why do we do that? Well, we're going to look at that today, and we're gonna talk about that today. When the flag comes down to half-staff, it is a position that helps us remember the fallen. The million plus people that have poured out their blood in service to our country. The American Revolution, 4,435 people died. The Civil War, 498,332 people died. In World War I, 53,402 died. In World War II, 291,557 died in battle. In Vietnam, 58,220 died. In the Persian Gulf War, the first one, 383 died. In the Iraq War, 4,410 died in battle. And the war in Afghanistan, 2,184 people died. We remember that. We think about that. We mourn for them. And it is right for us to remember the fallen. But then the flag is raised to full staff, which reminds us that us, the living, we better resolve to not let their sacrifice be in vain, to rise up in their place, to continue the fight for liberty and justice for all. And we, again, stand here and sit here today. People died for us so that we can have the right to preach the gospel freely. We have the right to live in peace. We have the right to pursue prosperity and to pursue happiness in this country. And we better thank God for those who provided this freedom for us. As we prepare to honor Memorial Day tomorrow, may we today remember the amazing sacrifice, the blood that was poured out, the battle that was fought over the tyranny of hell on our behalf. And we ought to remember that every Sunday. Every Sunday is a reminder, a memorial of what Jesus did for us because we gather on the day that Jesus arose from the dead. And today we're going to do that. We're going to observe Memorial Day once a year, but today and every Sunday we're going to remember that Sunday is a celebration of the memorial of the sacrifice of Christ. And we're actually going to see it in communion. We're going to look at that today a little bit, and we observe that here in this church once a month. If you don't regularly come on a Sunday night, I encourage you to do that. It's a totally different service, totally different music. We have a whole new sermon, and we have once a month on Sunday nights, a celebration of the resurrection, uh, a remembering of the death of Jesus Christ. And it's a wonderful time. It's actually an important part of how we grow as Christians. 
But on Memorial Day, we do three things. We mourn or think about the loss, the one that has died. We also remember those that have died. We remember their lives. We think about them. And then we thank God for the sacrifice that they give. And I think we should do those three things really every day, but especially on Sunday, but, and especially on Communion Sunday. Number one, we mourn the loss. We, we wish they were here. We had a funeral in this room yesterday. A woman that had served our community for 30 years as a sworn police officer. Uh, a woman that had helped our church in our security. And all of you were blessed by Officer Chris Parr. Uh, you didn't even know it. She would be in plain clothes on Sundays, but she would be here protecting you. We praise God, we've never had an incident, but we have a plan, we have people in place and ready to protect you and to sacrifice themselves for you. She was one of them, one of the early ones that we had in this room, in this building, protecting us, and then she would do that every day, Monday through Friday. Uh, she was a, a dear woman of God. Uh, her, her, uh, her department, Wheeling Police Department, were here yesterday uh, in droves, uh, her, her former boss, a uh, sergeant, was here, and he just said, man, that was a powerful service that you had for a powerful woman of faith. And that's what you want to hear from people after you die, I hope. And she was honored by Wheeling, by Gurney. She worked for Gurney Police Department. We had uh, Deerfield here. I saw a Chicago police officer here. We probably had over 100 police officers in this room and in the procession. I've never had such a smooth procession to a cemetery with probably about 10 cop cars in that procession. People did not know what was going on. But uh, it was a wonderful day, a sad day, of course. We mourn her loss, but we were able to spend time with Chris, her son Nick, in Israel as she was going through cancer treatments. We weren't sure if she was gonna be able to go. It, it looked very iffy. You know, probably many people thought she shouldn't be going to Israel, but she went. And I tell you, I'm glad she did. And I know she was glad she did. She got to do a lot of stuff, not everything, but almost everything. And it was a wonderful experience for her so that she can watch her adopted son, Nick, as, as he is in junior high here and he's gonna continue to flourish and grow in our community, in our church. Uh, and wonderful young man, but she would watch him as he would experience things, and that brought her so much joy. But we think about the person, Chris, and all of those that put themselves in harm's way to provide us protection and freedom, and they sacrifice themselves. Jesus provided that ultimate sacrifice. We think about Chris, we talked about her we miss her, we mourn the loss, we wish we could talk to her, we wish we could see her again, but we know we can one day, but for now we don't have that opportunity. But on Sundays, I think we should also mourn the loss of Christ. You say, wait a second, you say he, he rose again and he's alive, yes, but he did die. And I think every Sunday and every, uh, for sure every communion Sunday, we need to recognize the fact that the Son of God came. Now that's astounding. You say, and, and most people, if you're logical, if you're a thinking person, you're gonna say, wait a second, you're telling me the, the, the one who created everything, obviously big, powerful, amazing God, full of purpose and design. If you look in the, 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 the greatest microscope we have and you look at all the intricacy that makes up our world, it's incredible. I mean, it's amazing. And, and then you, you, you take a telescope and you zoom way out and, and you're able to see the vastness of our universe. I mean, so big, we cannot wrap our minds around it. The size of some of the stars. Our, our sun is like a little speck compared to the size of some of these stars. How big and how amazing is God? And you're saying this all-powerful God became a baby? And, and he must have been born somewhere famous. No, he was born in Bethlehem, just a little hamlet. Hardly anybody had ever heard of Bethlehem. You say, no, he should have been born in, if he's going to be born in Israel, he should have been born in Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. No, he was born in Bethlehem. He grew up in a little town of Nazareth. That was the picture we had up 
A picture on the bulletin of Chris and Nick yesterday. They were standing on the precipice over Nazareth. He just grew up as a boy in Nazareth. It's just hard to imagine Jesus, all powerful, almighty, the son of God, putting aside his power, his glory, his might, becoming a baby. You know, babies are challenging, aren't they? You're always cleaning them up, cleaning the mess up that they made. You know, they're, they're, they're definitely not neat freaks. Have you ever known a baby to be a neat freak? And there you have to clean up this baby. He would be helpless. He literally would be helpless, and his mom would have to come and, and help him in, in every way until he was able to grow up. He became a man, did many miracles in that same town of Nazareth, but yet he was nailed to a cross. You say, how could God Almighty allow himself to be nailed to a cross? That makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense until you understand how much he loves you. Why did he have to die? Why was he spat upon? Why was he humiliated? Why was he flogged? Why did God Almighty do that? It's because of my sin. And that's what we're to mourn today. Not the loss of Jesus for he's alive, but to mourn the reason that he died. That's what we are to mourn today, the reason that he died. For the Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are a lot of really good people, but all are sinners. Jesus died for sinners. That's why he came. That's why he allowed himself to be humbled to the death, even the death of the cross. And remember the, another amazing fact. Jesus died for millions of people. You know, over a million people sacrificed their life in battle for our freedoms in the United States. Jesus died for all of those people and all of the rest of the millions that have ever been conceived, have ever lived, will ever live. He died for millions, and that's kind of mind-boggling, right? He died for everybody. But yet, I'm convinced, if you were the only one he would have died for one. We can kind of grasp he died for millions, but it's hard for us to grasp he died for me. If I were the only one alive, he died for me. That one's tough. That one's profound. And that's why we must mourn his death and remember why he died. It says in Matthew 18, 12. How think ye if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and go into the mountains and seek that which is astray? And that's what they would do. It doesn't seem right. Why would you leave ninety-nine sheep and go after the one? Because the shepherd loves the sheep, all the sheep. That's how much God loves you. And if so be, verse 13, that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than the ninety and nine which went astray. Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heavy that, that one of these little ones should perish. God doesn't want anyone to be separated from him for eternity in hell. So Jesus would have died for that one. He died for millions. He died for all. But we still mourn the loss, the death of Christ. The reason that he died was for me. And then God gave us something to remember that. It's called the broken bread. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four, 24, the first part, it talks about he gave thanks as he was in this. We call it the Last Supper, the final meal. And uh, he had bread and he broke it. When we celebrate communion, we'll do that in two weeks on a Sunday night. We have people that take the unleavened bread, the crackers, and they break it into pieces. And then when you take one of those pieces, you're further, further breaking that down with your teeth and you're chewing it, you're breaking it. Jesus wanted you to remember his broken body. To remember why he died. Why? Because if you were the only one and he would have died for you and you're remembering that continually, at least monthly, here in this church, 
we are again being reminded of what he did for us and we're thanking him anew. We're remembering the, 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 the terribleness of his death and we're hopefully, the more we do that, the more grateful we are of what he did for us. Man, gratitude. How quickly we forget. How quickly we aren't thankful anymore. But that, that bread was broken just as Jesus body was broken for us. Something else we do on Memorial Day is we remember the the life, right? We remember the lives of those who died for us. In our funeral yesterday, we remembered Chris's life. A couple sisters got up and one talked about almost killing her sister twice accidentally. You missed a good funeral if you weren't here. It's really funny. I mean, she was an older sister, and her little girl, uh, baby sister came along, which was Chris, pushing her in her stroller, kind of running on a dock. I think the, the older sister was 12 or something, 14, and the little sister was just like one or two, and the, and the stroller fell in the lake. And she jumped in. She said it was only like three feet deep, and she was able to get the stroller up out of the water, and it was muddy, and it slipped out of her hands. So that was the twice part, she said. She obviously was able to, to uh, save her sister. Almost killed her twice, but save her sister. And we laughed, and we thought about that, and we, we remembered her life. We talked about her. And that's what we do, right? If you've lost someone in, in conflict, in battle, maybe you have. Uh, we, we, we remember not only the death and the loss, but we also remember the life. It's so important to remember the life. What do we remember when we remember the life? Well, we were in a cemetery yesterday, and I... I have a habit of kind of walking around and reading headstones. It's a good habit and it's a bad habit. The reason I say it's a bad habit uh, because some of them are, are a little funny, morbidly funny. One said, I told you I was sick. <laughs> Another one said, I knew this would happen. This one was really good. Here lies George Johnson hanged by mistake. He was right, we was wrong. But we strung him up and now he's gone. I don't think that was a real one. Anyways, I thought it was kind of interesting. Here lies an atheist all dressed up and no place to go. <laughs> I hope that one wasn't real. I hope it wasn't real. Here lies Byron Vickers, second fastest draw in New Austin. <laughs> that one's kind of funny, isn't it? But the grave, stones, epitaphs, the serious ones, safe in the arms of Jesus, faithful until death, gone but not forgotten, a tender mother, a faithful friend, Savior more than life to me, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Very interesting, very sobering, very impactful epitaphs on these grave markers that you see. But all of those kind of give us a little message about the person that was buried there. And likewise, Jesus left us an epitaph. Most communion tables that I've ever seen have the words, this do in remembrance of me. And that's the second part of the verse that we started with. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four 24 says, this do in remembrance of me. What should we remember about the life of Jesus? I think we should remember his power, his ability to heal, the fact that he helped people, that he helped the, the, the unlovely, that he didn't run away from the sinner. He didn't take part in the sin. He certainly condemned the sin, but not the sinner. For those sinners that came to him in faith, he forgave their sins. We should remember that. We should remember what he taught. As we read the, the scriptures, we read the gospels, he taught so much and such good stuff. We should know it. And, 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 and as we remember him, we remember his life, we remember his teaching. So this is important, but when we're at the Lord's table and when we're celebrating, we're not walking around a monument, observing it, admiring it. What we're doing is we're literally fellowshipping with a living Savior. That's why it's so important to be here when we celebrate that communion service. And I know many of you can't come. 
If you can't come on a Sunday night when we have our communion service, we have the next following Sunday in the morning, after the service in the morning, in the next room over, we'll have a second communion service for you. But it's part of growth. It's part of fellowship. How do we know that it's so important to celebrate communion? Because we see a warning if you're celebrating it unworthily. Look at 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven. 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. This was happening in Corinth. They were celebrating the, the communion, and there were people that were getting drunk, they were not taking it uh, seriously. It was, it, was, it was not proper. They weren't remembering him at all. And it was something that was very detrimental to them physically and spiritually. So we know if it was detrimental, if they were observing it incorrectly, that we, when we observe it correctly, it is something that will help us, help us build us up spiritually, help us to grow in Christ. We remember him not just as a headstone as a monument but we remember him and have fellowship with him and it's some of the sweetest fellowship you'll have with God is when we do that and and I would also say that I hope you're having sweet fellowship with him now as you remember him remember his life and remember his teaching so on Memorial Day we mourn the loss we also remember the life and then last we're thankful for the sacrifice. It was just a few weeks before Christmas in 1917. It was, uh, the, the snow was across Europe on the hillsides, but that snow was, was blackened by war. Trenches on one side held the Germans, on the other side, the trenches were filled with Americans. This was World War I, and the gunfire exchange was intense. Separating them, was a very narrow strip of no man's land with barbed wire in the middle. A young German soldier attempting to cross that no man's land was shot and then entangled in the barbed wire. He cried out in anguish and then in pain. He continued to whimper. Between the shells, all the Americans could hear was his scream. Finally, one American soldier couldn't hear that anymore, and he crawled out of his trench toward the German soldier. When the Americans realized what this soldier was doing, they stopped their firing, but the Germans continued. Then a German officer realized what the young American soldier was doing, and he ordered his men to cease fire. This hadn't happened in the war. There was a weird silence across no man's land, and on his stomach, the American made his way to the German soldier. He distangled him and stood up with the German in his arms and carried him straight toward the German trenches. He placed him in the waiting arms of his comrades. Having done so, he turned and started back toward the American trenches when a German officer reached out and grabbed him and spun him around. This German officer had previously won the Iron Cross, the highest medal that you can win in Germany. He took off his Iron Cross and he stuck it on the American soldier. The American then proceeded to walk back across and get into the American trenches. Unfortunately, the insanity of war continued But that German soldier was thankful for the sacrifice of the American soldier. And all the heroic acts, and there have been many on the battlefield, throughout all of history, that is what has made our country great. That sacrifice, the heroism. We are respected around the world, we are free, People admire the United States still today, and I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud to have been afforded the freedoms and prosperity that we've been afforded. 
but I also recognize today that it took blood to purchase that, and I'm thankful. I'm thankful for that sacrifice. And similarly, the price that Jesus paid afforded us salvation. We can't repay the people that sacrificed their blood for our freedoms, nor can we repay the sacrifice Jesus made on our behalf. We can't do it. We have the promise of eternal life. We have uh, anyone who receives by faith salvation has eternal life, and we literally cannot possibly pay for that. But we can be thankful. We must be thankful. And that's why when we receive the cup at communion, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, it says, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. When we drink of that juice, we remember the forgiveness. We remember the sacrifice. We thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ as he spilt it for us to clean us from sin. I love the old hymns. One of them goes like this. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed by the blood of the lamb? Are you fully trusting his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the precious, soul-cleansing blood of the lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the lamb? A beautiful song of remembering and thanking the Lord for his sacrifice, the blood that can get out any stain. Hebrews 9.13 contrasts the blood of Jesus with the blood of the animal sacrifices that had been offered really since Adam and Eve all the way through until Jesus died. It contrasts that, the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of the heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. In other words, the blood of animals was symbolic for a nation that they were admitting their need and they were pointing to the ultimate sacrifice that one day the Messiah would make. But that blood never cleansed sin. But it was a picture of a perfect blood sacrifice, a human perfect blood sacrifice that was to come. How much more, verse 14, shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Remember the flag, raised and then lowered. We remember his death. We remember him, his life, his teaching. But then that flag was raised and so was Jesus raised. And he's alive. And we remember him. Every Sunday, Communion Sunday, every day, remember again and again and again and again. And if it's getting old to you, if, if what I'm about to tell you is like, oh boy, here he goes again. He's gonna tell me how to get saved. Man, you should never ever get tired of that wonderful, wonderful message about that precious blood of Christ, free of any spot, can cleanse any stain. That precious, wonderful blood of Jesus. We remember the reason he died. We remember his life and what he did and his sacrifice. And we thank God again today. I, I don't think it would be wrong for you to thank God every day. Every day when you wake up, Lord, thank you for saving me. I don't deserve it. I thank you for the great love that you showered upon me. If I were the only one, Jesus would have still died for me. I thank you that he died for me. I thank you that he died for the millions. Thankfulness should be a, an important part of our lives and how quickly we forget, how quickly we start to complain. This God that's done all this for us and now we're worried about rent, 
We're worried about how we're going to uh, afford a uh, car payment. We're, we're worried about these things that compared to that, it's nothing, right? It's nothing. Remember him. Remember him. And that thankfulness, I believe, will inspire us to be godly people that are willing to sacrifice ourselves, a living sacrifice for him. But we have to remember to remember, lest we forget. All of us have sinned. We've said that today. You and me are sinners. We've fallen so short of the glory of God. I mean, it's not even funny. We are condemned by our sin to hell. The wages of sin is death. That's Romans 6.23. But that verse doesn't stop there. But the gift of God. Now watch this. This is Jesus. He was perfect, right? He released his power and his glory. He grew up. He was a man. He never sinned. But yet he was nailed to a cross. But the gift of God, watch. This is Jesus, is eternal life. He became sin. The perfect, righteous, and holy one, spotless, loves you so much that he took your sin. He died on a cross. He rose again, proving that he is God, proving that the Father accepted the sacrifice, and those that believe in him will not perish. That's hell, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I love sharing that message. I shared it yesterday. A room full of police officers. And man, they were glued. Why? Because it's the power of salvation. And they're risking their life every day. I hope every last one of them accepted the free gift yesterday. You don't know when you're last breath will be. No one's guaranteed that. Today should be the day of your salvation. It's by grace that you're saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of works lest any man should boast. Salvation is free. You can't do anything for it. All you must do is believe. Believe that Jesus died for you on a cross and rose again. Trust in him. You say, well, then why should we remember that all the time? Because it helps us to live in light of what he did for us, and it empowers us, to, it keeps us close to him, and it allows the Spirit of God to empower us to do great and mighty things for him. Not to save us, not to keep us saved, but to show the world that we have believed. It's a glorious thing. You must believe in him. You say, well, I, I need to be religious. I need to be good. I need to try. Well, you're trying to save yourself by good works, and they can't save you. It's not of works. It says it right there. It's not of works. Salvation is by faith, just by receiving the finished payment of Jesus on the cross, and then living a life in light of that is how we thank him for the ultimate amazing sacrifice he gave for our freedom. What are we freed from? We're freed from the penalty of sin, which is hell. That's amazing. We're freed from the power of sin in our life where the sin no longer has to dominate us. And also, one day we will be freed from the very presence of sin. And Chris Parr is experiencing that now. Do you know Christ as Savior? You can believe in him right here, right now. Would you please bow? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want this to be a, a moment just privately between you and Almighty God. Today you walked in this room and you thought you had to be good and you had to do something and you realized today that there is a God. He loves you. He died for you. He rose again. And all he ask, is asking for you to do is trust in him as your only way to heaven. You can say something like this to the Lord in silent prayer. Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't do anything about that. I can't save myself. But right now, I believe. I put my trust in the Lord Jesus, the perfect Son of God who died in my place as if I were the only one. He died for my sin. I trust in him. The one who rose again the third day, who's alive today, I believe in him. 
And by the authority of the word of God, at the very moment of faith, you have eternal life. You've passed from death into life. You are eternally saved. And now may all of us live in light of that wonderful salvation. Have you done that today? Can I pray for you? In a moment, I'm gonna ask for you to raise your hand if you've put your trust in Christ. By raising your hand, you're just saying, hey, Pastor Scudder, today I put my faith in Christ. Raising your hand is not what saves you, but raising your hand, I believe, will give you strength as you are showing me that today you've put your faith in Christ and I'd like to pray for you. Would you raise your hand right now if you've put your faith in Jesus today? I see one, I see another. Any others today? It's a big room. Hold it up for just a moment. Any others today? Say, today is the day of my salvation. Today I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I see another, I see many others today. We thank God for all of you. Lord, how grateful we are for eternal life. For the precious blood of Jesus. May we never forget that. May we never forget your life. May we have fellowship with you all the time. Father, may we thank you by serving you. We thank you for the many that have indicated salvation today. Lord, we welcome them as the angels rejoice into the family of God. In Jesus' precious and holy name, we pray these things. Amen.